Hi everyone, so my server power efficiency video kind of blew up, at least uh, according to my channel standards, and I just wanted to thank you guys for all the positive comments and all the attention the video got, this is really cool, thank you all. And in this video, I just kind of wanted to answer the questions and some comments that you guys left under the video in this kind of like a non-scripted and uh, off-the-cuff way. There is not going to be any like cool editing, no scripts, no fancy lighting or whatnot. It's just going to be me sitting in front of the computer and answering guys' questions. So let's do it, I guess. The first question left by Antioch 18 x and a lot of you guys asked the same thing. What device are you using to measure and track the system power utilization? So I'm actually using those. These are called Shelly Plug S. They cost about 16 euros a pop. They're really cool. You just, you know, plug the device here and plug this whole contraption in the outlet. And it runs a little web server that basically tracks the power usage. You can integrate it in Home Assistant, in MQTT, OpenHab, whatever. And you can also just throw the stock firmware out of the window and install Tasmoda, which is an open source firmware for like smart home things. And I've also installed the Unraid plugin uh, that has like this widget for Tasmoda and power stats, so that's what I'm using. Arson asks, I'm searching for low energy managed switches. Do you have any tips on this topic too? So I actually don't have a lot of experience with switches. I've only tried Unify and Microtech, and I also have this uh, TP-Link unmanaged switch thingy. And basically, if you can, you should avoid managed switches if you you know, trying to go for the maximum power efficiency because managed switches will obviously kind of need to have more brain to do all the managed switching thing and uh, those will consume more power. So if you can do everything with VLANs and just, you know, untagged VLANs, I think that's called, do that. But if you can't, uh, I have this Microtech CRS236 switch and uh, it draws around 12 watts on average when you know it's doing the, the regular stuff and I think that's pretty power efficient. You can also use a lot of Microtech switches, I think CRS series is especially good at that as routers, but Microtech's router OS is uh, kind of like super convoluted and is it's very different from, for example, OpenWRT or OPN Sense or PF Sense and I didn't really like it, so that's why I don't do it. Alan Mongado asks, what about startup power consumption? I believe that it's important as well, especially when starting up several hard drives. Power usage will spike if all hard drives power up at the same time. Starting hard drives one at a time will prevent that spike. So that's actually a good question, but um, when it comes to the initial startup spike, uh, it doesn't have like a lot of influence on the overall average power consumption of your machines. Unless of course you reboot very often or something. And usually in order to implement the staggered spin-up you need a fancy HBA card that would support this functionality and HBA cards are also power hungry and basically you're not gonna win much by doing that anyway. If you're trying to do this by uh, kind of get a lower wattage PSU, maybe pick a PSU or something that couldn't otherwise handle all of those hard drives spinning up at once, this is a bad idea and you will need to get a PCU that can handle all of your hard drives at the same time. A lot of operating systems will at some point need to spin up all hard drives at the same time. For example, Unraid will try and spin them up sequentially when you just access the data, but when you stop or start the array, the drives will be spun up all at the same time. And the same thing will happen when you shut down the server or start it up. So I really don't recommend doing this as some kind of a way to get away with running a lower wattage PSU. This is not a good idea. You will probably have your PSU fail at some point. Sign Quan Known asks, thanks for the video. I've been also obsessed with my energy consumptions. What do you think of M1 slash M2 chips in the future? They could drastically reduce watt consumption even more. And also Miss to Chill uh, kind of left a comment, a similar one, or just get a Mac mini. So if the modern technology and computing trends are anything to go by, I think Apple will go actually the way of increasing performance while increasing the power consumption a little bit or, you know, like in the best case scenario, keeping it the same. So Mac Minis are really cool, they're super powerful, they're relatively power efficient, 
But the problem with those machines is that they have basically zero expansion. So you can't upgrade the RAM, you can't put uh, SSD or hard drives in them. I mean, of course, you can buy one of those Thunderbolt enclosures that give you a SATA slot or a couple, but those tend to cost a lot because Thunderbolt is kind of a complicated technology. At the end, you will basically end up with a device that costs around the same amount of money as a pretty decent desktop PC, but without all the advantages. And one of the points that I wish I kind of went uh, harder on in my video is optimizing power efficiency and upfront costs. Because to me, your power efficiency conquest, uh, it, has to, it has to make sense at some point. You have to break even on the hardware costs. And if you buy something super expensive, but very power efficient, you would probably save money by maybe sacrificing a little bit of power efficiency, but getting something cheaper. Like for example, some of those ultra small form factor PCs from Dell, Lenovo, or HP. Those are probably as small or smaller in some cases than Mac mini, but at the same time, they do have SATA slots and upgradable RAM. Are they as powerful or as revolutionary as Mac mini? Maybe not, but they also cost three times less, so uh, pick your poison, I guess. <laughs> a couple of people also had uh, an issue with me saying that my server mostly idles. For example, Chris Oversmith writes, What's the sense of building a server with the focus on ideal power consumption? And Nick Leitch also wrote, Set up torrent on your server and half of the video is pointless. Deep sleep, raid caching, spin up down. LOL. And that's that's one of the points that I also wish I, I maybe expressed better. When I said idle power consumption, I meant in comparison to a typical desktop computer that gets turned on to do some power consuming stuff like gaming, video editing, work, uh, etc. Obviously my server doesn't run nothing and I don't propose that y'all just stare at your servers doing nothing and marvel at the amazing power consumption. Of course my home server also runs a lot of things, it runs stuff like Jellyfin, Deluge, Sonar, Raider, Booksonic, Terraria, all of those things are constantly running on my server and still it has a pretty good power consumption. So those numbers that I show in the video, 23 watts on average per month, that's with all of those things running and me sometimes editing off of those SSDs. Which brings us to the next point that some people kind of misunderstood. For example, uh, what what asks, you say you use your NAS for video editing. I always thought NAS is a file server. Please make a video on what a NAS actually does. So some people uh, took me saying I edit off of the NAS as basically I edit on the NAS which isn't true, I edit on my laptop, and my home server just serves as a big SSD file storage that I access over the 10 gig network. So basically I keep footage that I'm editing currently on those SSDs, and thanks to the 10 gig connection, my video editing software can access them in you know really, really fast manner. And because of that, the performance is basically similar to editing this you know, off of my laptop's internal SSD. But unlike my laptop's internal SSDs, uh, those SSDs and the NAS, the SSD array can fit much more stuff. And I'm gonna tell you, uh, a lot of my video folders with like footage sources and stuff can get as big as 300 gigabytes, sometimes a terabyte, that's just for one video. So I, I do need a lot of storage and fast storage doesn't hurt for sure. So a lot of people also mentioned that uh, the CPUs in the uh, spreadsheet don't support ECC RAM, at least most of them, so there is no point in uh, building them for your home server because you need ECC RAM support. So that's actually a very common misconception that I see a lot of people say. So people tend to think that in order to get ECC RAM support, you need a Xeon CPU. And that's just not true, because uh, all of the i3, Celeron, and Pentium CPUs up to 10th generation, I think, they all support ECC RAM, provided you have a C series motherboard. So, for example, C236 or C246. Now, Intel understood that this was a big mistake, so if I'm not mistaken, starting with the 10th generation of uh, Intel CPUs, you will need a Xeon CPU to get ECC support. So, thank you, Intel. Very cool. Leonardo Bocciazzo, sorry for butchering this, wrote, you should probably use a SATA SSD or a SATA notebook hard drive. 
that's surely going to be more power efficient than server hard drives. That's actually true and a lot of you know serious server hardware channels and outlets don't really cover that. So 2.5 inch hard drives do tend to consume much less than the 3.5 inch hard drives. And if you can live with the fact that you know most of those hard drives are SMR and not CMR, and if you're okay with the data density that they provide, of course, you're not gonna be able to get a 12 terabyte laptop hard drive. This is definitely an option for like, you know, ultimate power consumption build. And also those do tend to be cheaper, so there's that. So Scorpion 1298, and a lot of people also left similar comments. PowerTop only shows C1 for my PC, what's wrong? The first thing you're gonna wanna do is to boot up an Ubuntu or Debian or Fedora Live USB, install PowerTop, execute PowerTop Autotune, and see if anything changes. Uh, if nothing changes, then it's your hardware, but if it does go lower, then you might have a configuration issue with your current OS, so you might wanna, you know, investigate that. Failing that, if, you know, if this changed nothing, Basically what I would do is I would disconnect everything that isn't essential to my computer's boot up process, then boot it up again and see if anything changes. And then if you do get to C6, C8, I would just start adding stuff one by one and see what's the culprit. But if that doesn't help either, then you're SOL, unfortunately. It's just a platform and or something else and basically you would need to replace hardware, so CPU or motherboard or the whole thing. Computer enthusiasts wrote, those motherboards are too expensive when it will only save you maybe 10 to $20 a year in energy savings. So that's actually also not true because uh, in the spreadsheet that I linked in the pink comments, you, you will see a lot of motherboards from all kinds of you know different price brackets. There's, for example, the ASRock J4125, which includes a CPU, it's built in, it's soldered in, and it costs around $100, or you can also find them used for less. There are also uh, H110 and H310, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, motherboards. Those are basically consumer-grade motherboards. They also cost less than 100 euros, and you can find them less than 50 if you're lucky. I would also look into MSI Echo Series motherboards. Those those are also like you know pretty pretty bare bones consumer motherboards, and they shouldn't cost a lot used, especially since we're talking about CPUs that are like five to six years old at this point. So you definitely can build a power efficient server on the cheap, and you don't have to buy a super expensive you know mini TX motherboard to do that. Millions of people run Ryzen CPUs on Linux just fine, me included, and never have heard that they evidently still suffer from a random freeze bug. Sorry, pure FUD. So the funny thing is if we scroll a little bit lower, we actually see one comment from Marfilm saying, my biggest regret was upgrading my server to my older Ryzen 5 1600. It draws 50 watt idle, which is not great, and I had to disable C states because it froze constantly. <laughs> so evidently some people do still have this issue, and especially when it comes to the first gen Ryzen CPUs, those aren't super power efficient and they do tend to you know, have this kind of wacky C state support, which is still a problem on modern Linux systems. And of course this is like the first generation, so why am I even talking about it in the year of our Lord 2022? And that's for the same reason that I'm still talking about the 6th and 7th gen of Intel CPUs, because they're cheap and they're good enough for server stuff, so why not? So some people also got super offended on behalf of Nvidia and Intel, for example, this person wrote, 1490 is actually the most power efficient GPU ever. Stop misleading people. Newest CPUs as well. And there were a couple of similar comments. So I think I wouldn't be wrong when I said that not many people will buy a 1490 for server usage. Now, of course, putting graphics cards in servers is nothing new. Like a lot of people have 1060s, 1050s, and Quadra cards for Plex encoding and other stuff. But frankly, I don't see a lot of people putting 1490s, you know, and using them in a home lab server environment, so I don't see how this is relevant. But also, yes, maybe I should have precised that I'm talking about power consumption in general and not power efficiency as in gigaflop per watt. And balancing power and performance is also, I think, very important, because what do you care about power efficiency of something like 12900K? You know, it can be very efficient when it comes to uh, performance per watt, but at the same time, if you deploy it in your server, it probably is going to consume, like, way too much. Unless, of course, you need all that power, which not a lot of people do. So 
That's kind of my problem with comments like that. The Lost Starbounder wrote, how about using a mobile CPU and mobile motherboard? So that's actually a very good point. And one of my favorite, you know, low power and low budget NAS motherboards is ASRock J4125, which technically doesn't have a mobile CPU, but it does have an embedded uh, Atom class chip. Those are still plenty enough for something like Nextcloud, Deluge, you know, maybe like a little Terraria or Minecraft server, and they're very efficient. Like you can get as little as five to seven watts power consumption for just the motherboard alone. And then they will also usually have four SATA slots and a PCIe slot, just X1, but still, so you can use them as a home NAS, which will be really efficient, really cheap, and would make a lot of people happy, I think. Andrew Louise wrote, with this Ryzen 3600, you can activate eco mode and BIOS going from 65 watts to 45 watts. So this is, once again, kind of touching on the topic of TDP versus actual real life power consumption. And what eco mode and BIOS is gonna do is exactly just reduce the max power consumption ceiling. So the idle power consumption or semi-idle power consumption is gonna stay the same. 4D, 4D rows, TLDR, use Debian, use DietPy, try me, mommy won't mind. So this is this is kind of a, an amazing word salad. I had to I had to reread it like five times to understand what this means. But basically, in my experience, there isn't much uh, tangible difference between different distributions when it comes to power consumption. And if you kind of scroll through uh, the forum, the German forum that I linked in the comments, you will see that some people also get as little as seven or nine or 12 watts in Windows. You know, Windows is the embodiment of the word bloat, so it must consume more power than Linux, right? But at the same time, with the same configuration and, you know, Linux instead of Windows, people will get the same power ratings. So I don't think this has, you know, that much of a tangible impact on your power consumption. So this is gonna be it for this video. My voice just can't handle any more reading and talking. And yeah, I hope you liked it. If you want me to make more of those, you know, off the cuff, unscripted videos, let me know, I guess. And yeah, I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.